When you are buying with the intention of selling, it's really speculation, not long-term investing, and you really need to distinguish between the two things. One of the guiding principles that I always look at in my trifecta reviews is, so I would be looking back and getting the oldest reliable selling price and what its current value is, and I would take a look at how that compares with the unit median price for the suburb over the same time period. Has it outperformed the suburb? And How has it gone compared with houses? Welcome to Perth Property Insider, where you will learn how to grow your wealth and improve your life using Perth property. Our show is brought to you by Investors Edge Real Estate, the highly rated and award-winning property management, sales and buyers agency servicing the whole of Perth. Now, here's your host, Jared Mann. G'day, it's Jared from Investors Edge Real Estate here, bringing you another Q&A episode from questions getting asked on our Perth Property Investment Facebook group. If you're not already a part of the conversation, head over to Facebook, search, have your questions and help with other people's questions on there too. So I pulled these out. I thought they'd be highly relevant to all our listeners or at least uh, some of the questions are going to hopefully through give you my opinion and give you my pointers and stay tuned because I've got a bit of a common theme towards the end to really address what a lot of people are asking in the market and of me at the moment. So let's dive into it. Can the buyer get out of the contract after signing the rework contract, but before paying the deposit. Is the contract in effect if the deposit has not been paid? Now, as a sales agent, um, as well as a buyer's agent, we see all the time or people are throwing out offers all over the place. In many cases, buyers have put two offers or more is the wrong thing to do because you should be deciding if a property fully stacks up and if you're in fully interested in it and only making one offer at a time because what can happen is two or more offers can be accepted and you're actually committed to proceeding on that property. It's a no calling off period and you really are jerking the seller, the sales agent and potentially all the other buyers that are interested in that home around if you are putting in an offer without the full intention of being able to proceed on that. I'd also discover certain aspects about the property later that you you know weren't aware of to put you off. That's a legitimate concern for people. Or perhaps you just change your mind for whatever reason. If you've had your offer already accepted, that is legally binding, you are usually required to pay your deposit within five or seven days. Then is for the seller to issue you a default notice and then the contract would be terminated from there if your deposit is still not paid. So because that is a legally binding contract, the seller actually has pursue you for any difference in selling price. If they went on to sell the property for $20,000 less or $50,000 less, and of course, no seller wants to sell their property for less, the amount that you offered was way above asking price, they would potentially have a case to take against you to sue you for any difference in that selling price that they have then missed out on. Now, many sellers won't go to the effort of doing this. There is significant legal costs and other things involved to, to do it. But if the, if that gap is large enough, then, you know, it costs them 10000 in, in legals, then some sellers will potentially pursue you for that. So, you don't want that in your world and hanging over you. If you've already de- pay, paid your deposit and you just choose to walk away like and not proceed, Uh, At that point, what are the valid ways to get out of a sale contract? Well, if you are subject to finance and your finance ends up getting declined, then and the contract can then be terminated and your deposit in that case would be refunded. So you may actually have grounds with your finance broker and or bank to get saying that you're not able to proceed, that your finances decline because you aren't going to probably qualify for finance on two properties. But if you've got to be able to get that letter because you could actually qualify for the for loans on both, if that makes sense. Now, other potential ways that you can terminate a contract um, properly and get your deposit back is if you've included other. So these may not be a very acceptable especially when you're up against other offers in this market. But in a cooler market, many buyers would include subject to complete satisfaction. Any sort of issues came up at all, you'd have grounds to potentially terminate and get your deposit back if it was subject to complete satisfaction. Sometimes buyers insert a due diligence clause, so subject to satisfactory inspection of the property within seven days uh, with deposit return in full, if not satisfied and not proceeding. 
Others include subject to due diligence, uh, you know, for seven days, 14 days, satisfactory due diligence, uh, the contract with the deposit being returned in full. Now, of course, I'm not a solicitor. I'm not a settlement agent. So worth speaking to those professionals when you're trying to put these conditions together for your contract if things investigated and you know you may have a legitimate concern about the structure and want your conditions to cover you to get out so to speak to them and get the input before you sign your contract to use if needed now next question if you already own two properties what's the healthy loan to value ratio for the two loans before you embark on trying to get another that's a good question on your stage of life and how much you want to push things and I'd always come back to what's your larger strategic portfolio plan. Your plan might involve you, if you've only got, if you're still young and in that acquisition phase, I would be looking to pull the equity up to 80% every time that's available for you to make another purchase. And why 80%? Because when you go above people, they do go up to 90% and pay that lender's mortgage insurance each time because it's the difference of them getting in, getting into the market versus having to wait a much longer time. So again, I think it would depend on what's your savings rate. How quickly do you expect these properties to keep going up to giving you equity? Looking at that higher loan to value ratios at certain points, especially like now in the market when the opportunity in front of us is great and time is going to hold you back from that opportunity. But in general, I'd be looking to go up to 80% and I would be looking to have an overall strategic plan so to guide what they need to get to your goals for passive income and wealth. Hopefully that helps. Next question. If you have already got three properties in Wanneroo, Treby and Darge, so they're northern, maybe not as familiar with where that is, so feel free to Google map it and I will <laughs> after this episode too. But all three are in Perth and the property holding cost is total at 10k yearly. And he's got a 100k buffer. Um, should he take advantage of Perth's hot market and sell one of them to book some pro profit or wait for some time in one to three years? No, there's no issue on cash flow. Now, I think this portfolio plan for, you, for how are you going to get to your goals? And for me, I would only be buying... At would only be buying with the intention of selling and getting out if a sale was needed to fit into that plan or to enable an ex purchase that you can't otherwise make hold for the long term. Because every time you buy and sell a property, you're paying entry and exit costs. And I think when you are buying with the intention of selling, it's really speculation, not long term investing. And you really need to distinguish, you know, between the two things. So a long-term investor lets the power of compounding work and they're prepared to ride that the long-term ebbs and flows because compounding, that's where the power comes to actually grow your wealth. And looking at compounding of rental price that comes over time and goes a long way towards replacing your income as these three properties continue. So I would be looking at your overall strategic plan and seeing are these three properties going to actually get you to what you want for and by what date you're working back from? And if they aren't, I'd be using the equity to go from 65% LVR up to 80%. And, you know, 100K buffer is a very big buffer. Having a buffer is great, but it's probably not needed, especially if you still need to acquire more property and keeping a 20K buffer. It depends on everyone's comfort zone, what their job situation is, what their surplus cash flow is. But I would be looking at keeping a potentially lower buffer if all those things are solid and especially big all and keeping in mind interest rates are quite high so when interest rates go back down again rents continue to go up again it's going to be in a lot stronger cash flow position so i would be looking to acquire i'll be looking to do that strategically fitting an overall plan i wouldn't be looking to dipping my toe in and, and pulling it out and time the market and speculate on when the upside is because it's always hard to choose that top as well so the only reasons for me to sell would be, have I got an inferior asset? Does, this, does one of these properties not fit my overall plan? Or do I need to sell to enable a home upgrade uh, to occur? And then towards the end of when you get closer to retire debt, sell to put money into other asset classes. But I'm not hearing any reasons here, any strong reasons why you would look at selling. Hope that helps. Next question. Hey, Jared, two questions if I could. 
given the current the dire market imbalance with little new supply coming on or even being economically viable yet a local demand where how and when do you see this frenzy ending if you could per uh second part of the question if you could personally buy a property tomorrow where and what would it be thank you it is hard to see beyond the next year but things are looking very good and i think that we've probably got two to three years ahead and and both over the last three years with most suburbs having done 30 to 50 percent from their low points before that and that sounds like a lot of 30 to 50 percent and it is if you bought then so people are sitting on fantastic gains already but when i actually look back over the 10 year average half percent average annual growth rate over the last 10 years so they still have underperformed compared to the long term and i think they've got around double the growth that they've had so far to go to bring us back up to that sort of five to seven percent average annual growth rate that you're wrong that suburbs performed and and is performing and popular now so also when i look at other researchers they have noted that suburbs will often outperform the long-term average so if the long-term average for a suburb is five percent it's been doing two percent drift back towards that five percent but many suburbs will actually go up to performing at seven eight percent long uh, average annual growth rate over a 10 year period so they'll they'll exceed their long-term average for a while especially if they buy a longer period of below average growth to even things out so when i consider most suburbs are at that sort of two two and a half percent long-term uh, 10 year average point a further two times the level of growth that we've had now so if most suburbs have done 30 50 percent we could be seeing anywhere from 60 percent up to a further 100 so hopefully that helps to see how long the growth could be ahead interest rates kept us our growth more restrained and spread out and subdued but the secret's obviously i think conservatively we should have two to three years ahead and the next year year is very certain and it's always hard to see beyond a year so that's what i'm certain about two to three years is what i'm optimistic about and i can keep you updated as we go but getting back to the last person's question you know i would just be buying a property when it fits my plan and when i can and holding for the long term not trying to time things perfectly and that approach is far better than trying to time when you get in when you get out etc and if i could personally buy probably tomorrow where would it be and where and what well that i can afford and i would be making that in a area that's fully established it's got limited land supply that's unique that's desirable that's preferably got great schools driving things and i would be then vetting the property to fit to have very strong history of growth very strong short-term predictions for growth and fully check out at all the suburb level then i'd be making sure their area checks out is it making sure there's no homes west around that it's got a real bushfire prone area and i would be making sure that this whole area checks out around the property and then i'd be vetting the property and making sure it stacks up that it's going to be desirable in a good market well and in many cases i've bought properties that have development potential so that's another thing to vet and check out and you know that gives you the option later to go uh, with better quality dwellings on the property or newer dwellings on the property but i obviously have said in the past that i wouldn't go buying a development site just for the sake of it and trading off location and everything else just to get in percent gain on development is not going to make up for a sub par performance over the long term you know, on an inferior property so hopefully that helps and get in touch with us on uh, with, if you if you need some help buying in perth we've got service that can help get the bigger picture together before we dive in and make some great purchases next question with a 530k budget what's the best suburbs to get a decent house in thanks had that but impossible very difficult to find something that's a reasonable house that's you know well presented and neat and i'm not talking renovated i'm just saying ori fairly original condition neat well presented that's going to attract the reasonable tenant that rear so it's really hard even to to buy something that's under 570 at the moment where a lot of the clients we're looking for at the low end we're moving up to a 600k purchase which seems to be the new minimum of what you need to get into something that's reasonable go higher i would be looking to get into a villa 
or a subdivided uh, property instead. It's going to give you, you know, a better quality of property to hold without all the headaches that's going to come if you start trading off the wrong things. Undervalued compared to the the increase in prices of houses. And if you are going to look to buy a villa, I'd be looking at something in a small group, no more than four, with low or no strata fees. The common property well set up. It'd be nice if you get a double garage. It'd be nice if you could get a second bathroom. Not essential on those if you're able to get into a better location. And it's great if it was street front, so it had its own driveway. That would be another fabulous bonus. And then you're looking for all the things that are desirable on the inside. So set up well for rental with hard flooring, ideally. I'm um, appealing kitchen and bathrooms, alfresco, ideally two guys, living area, master bedroom, a decent size. And you can continue to, you know, look for further benefits from there. But what is always going to be important is its location, its overall appeal. And there's plenty of upside to a lesser extent, but Bill is certainly in the market now and things have gotten very hot at these price points. So worth considering if you can't increase your budget to probably 600k now in Perth to get into a decent house. So this sort of, I'm going into some of these considerations now if you've got a lower budget. And it's obviously what this person's up sort of considering. I think I would be sticking to houses if you've got a budget of 600k or above. I'd then look at villas as my second option. And it's always going to come back to how unique it is and how much asset class. And if you then can't afford a villa and it's going to take time for your savings to, or equity to accrue to get into the market, you could then look for apartments in smaller groups and greater land value associated with them. You want to really vet the strata to make sure there's no hidden surprises or major costs coming up because that can really torpedo your returns. And apartments at the moment are pushing 7% yields. And if you can find one with a reasonable strata fees, percent net after the strata fees, very decent and looking very good compared to houses as well on the yield. And because they've underperformed for so long, they're going to revert to their averages and they already are. And there should be decent upside on apartments in the coming. I'll be checking that checking those out if your budget's more limited and you can't get into something at 600k and above for a house. Next question, would you consider strata properties in primo suburbs? Think Cot, Claremont, Netherlands, Delft. Tying in with my last answer, I would be looking for villas first, followed by apartments. And one of the guiding principles that I always look at in my trifecta reviews is, so I would be looking back and getting the oldest reliable selling price and what its current value is. And I would take a look at how that compares with the unit median price for the suburb over the same time period. Has it outperformed the suburb? And how has it gone compared with houses? So I'd still be hoping for at least 4.5% growth over the long term, 3% or lower. So I would really be sticking clear of those. But you know, most houses have typically done 5 to 7%. So if you can get something that's done 5% plus as a unit, and keep in mind the last 10 years it hasn't done you know, very much growth at all, that's going to be a very good sign if you look at the 10-year growth average rate as well. And it's probably going to be 1% or very low. There should be plenty more upside for it to revert to its longer term history of in more primo suburbs. But I think you'll find that villas in there, the prices are already going to be very high because a lot of people have been downsizing from their big family homes, especially if they go through Senate or they're both downsizing together. They've pushed the prices up on a lot of the, the villas and smaller properties in these areas. So you may also be priced out of them relating back to what to do at different budgets uh, in my previous answers. So worth consideration. What is the consensus on short in the June Lap area near hospital, shopping centre and train? So relating back to my previous answers, I think the potential is very good. And a lot of the units are going to see decent upside. I think it's a group where there's going to potentially be oversupply when the market turns around. I'd be sticking to as low a density as you can and Joondala may not have too much of that. So that would really be a governing principle and I'd only be going uh, scaling down in from houses to villas to apartments if I didn't have the budget for houses. Just, I think there will be a rebound in price. I think if you've wanted to get out of that asset for some time, I'd be 
making sure you get in touch with me. We can look at the market every six months. We can see where it sits and we can look at, at the best time that we can so that you maximize your sale price. And then if you're looking to get into better assets, we've just got to decide, you know, is it worth waiting and missing out on the upside of whatever else you might get into? What do we sell now? And have you got enough to get into that better asset, whether that be an upgrade to your home or, or a better investment property now so that you can reap greater benefits over the coming years than you otherwise might on the apartment and decide when we can make the move to something better and when we can, it's usually good to pull the trigger and now is certainly a good time to be selling apartments if you're in that boat and I'm getting good turnouts to home opens, multiple offers and the apartments. Final question, which I might not answer the whole of because this person went really deep on what they're asking and I do have an upcoming episode where I'm going to go into its villas and how that relates to houses and both historically and in the future so that people can have a real deep dive into this more affordable. Could you please provide your expert analysis on the pros and cons of investing in both apartments and houses as a second investment property? I've got more to their questions, but I'll answer this part first. So pros and cons, well, higher average annual growth rate over the long term with units or apartments having had a higher rental yield on average over the long term. Cycles of each of these asset classes, and keep in mind I'm speaking high level sort of generalities, there's always exceptions to to this, but the growth curve and cycle of apartments has been a lot more volatile, a lot more of a roller coaster. The deeper, higher demand from overseas migrants and from people getting pushed out of the other asset classes, so that demand has to be strong enough with people not being able to afford houses at the time and with people, migrants coming over and being, and so they always fuel demand for this type of asset class stronger than when migration drop, had dropped off to very little, when the demand in the overall market was very little, well, houses stood up the best over that time. One of the cons of buying an apartment can be that you're not in complete control and you've got the common area which can be a real drag if there's large works or large problems that keep or if that common area it can involve outside walls roofs lifts car parking you know gardens landscaping pools potentially if these are all not being managed well so you really need to vet and make sure that these things are clean and they don't have problems or large costs coming up and you should be able to get a copy of the 10-year maintenance plan and that's going to give you a very good idea as to what costs are coming up, what issues are being discussed and how clean that strata, strata setup is. So other pros and cons, well, it's typically going to have a higher depreciation that you can offset against your tax. So that's all dependent, of course, on the age built. You've got to compare apples with apples, more depreciation that you can claim versus an older one, obviously. So other than... Uh, the growth versus rental yield, you're going to get more growth on the houses, more rent on the apartments. It can be a bit more set and forget with an apartment because it does have a cost. It's also very hands-off and someone else is managing. The strata manager is looking after and keeping up the repairs on all those things. And it's not something that you need to particularly worry about as an apartment owner and the rest of the group. You just have to worry about the inside of your apartment and, keep it, and, and the maintenance costs for keeping that up and that effort and management involved in keeping that up. So it can potentially involve a lot. Any manager, they're going to take care of that all anyway with a house. So important to keep your asset well maintained and well presented so that you can attract quality tenants at any stage of the market too. So subparts, they were interested in which we've covered ongoing maintenance costs, which we've also covered and potential tax implications covered. Addish additionally, any insights on the current market trends and future outlook for both property types. So I think Units as a whole asset class are going to exceed over the next couple of years. And that's a big call, isn't it? In general, I'm saying. So there'll still be some houses, some suburbs that are going to you know, go exceptionally well and exceed units and apartments and all units are going to exceed houses. So there is that short-term opportunity here as you know, prices revert back to their long-term you know, intrinsic value that they should be worth. I mean, it's just crazy when we see 
the pricing on some apartments and the yields that they're getting and that they will bounce back. So potentially worth considering, especially if you don't have the higher budget to get into houses, but I'd always be buying anything with a long-term focus, not just focusing on short-term gain and speculation. So I don't know if you have a uh, share, post us a review, it would be really appreciated. I read every one of them and, and I really appreciate our listeners. And if you're not already a member of Perth Property Investment Facebook group, head on over and join in the conversation. Catch you on the next one. Just a reminder, the information discussed in this podcast is general in nature. As we don't know your specific situation, you should always seek professional advice before taking any action. For free market reports on your suburb of interest and other helpful resources to grow your wealth, make sure you join my property investor update at Investors Hedge dot com dot au slash join and finally make sure you're a member of our perth property investment facebook group to be part of the conversation with other like-minded investors get help to your questions and get a feel for what's going on out there in the market i'll see you in the group